Hi everyone, it's Peter from Rock Daydream Nation and I've got a special guest with me today, Stan Zabka. And we're going to cover the top five Deep Purple albums of all time. How's it going, Stan? Pretty good, thanks Peter. Thanks for the invite. I'm very keen to be talking about Deep Purple today. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, Deep Purple is probably uh, Stan and my, one of our top three, top four bands of all time. We've spoken about this band over, must be at least 20 years. And um, yeah, it's just a good opportunity just to have a bit of a chat and go through our top five. Um, so Stan, why don't you fire away with your number five? Okay, uh, my number five, uh, I've chosen Come Taste the Band, uh, released in 75, uh, a Mark IV my only Mark IV that made it into my uh, list of five. Uh, I know there was number 19 in the UK albums chart in uh, Purple's 10th studio album. Um, look, a great lineup of songs. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I remember when I first bought it, uh, I remember inspecting the album cover and I was feeling some concern uh, with the absence of Blackmore. And I thought, was that going to kill the band? Uh, Coverdale had continued on well where Gillan had left off. But a new lead guitarist who might not be able to spar with John Lord, I was a little bit pensive about that. And someone who couldn't live up to Blackmore expectations, it could have spelt the end for the band, I was thinking. You know, I was partway through the album when I first listened to it, and I was pleasantly surprised and very relieved. It was a good experience. You know, it's not a, uh, a readily recognisable Deep Purple album. Uh, I, and I've heard Gillen and Lord saying exactly that. It's not a real Deep Purple album. But in my opinion, it was Purple finding themselves a new place, if you like, a distinctly different sound. And much of that was due to the input from Tommy Bolan. Um, the album opener, Coming Home, jumps out at you. I loved it when I first switched it on. It made me sit up and listen. Oh, this is something different. Uh, and I, I read um, you know, a, lot, a lot of good reports about that first track as well, how it does uh, really jump out at you and, and, and make you pay attention. You now, Tommy Bolan really brought his own individual style uh, to this album. Uh, and uh, it's just a shame that he, he just wasn't around with us for much longer because I think that would have really helped create a new following, a renewed following, if you like, for Purple. And that could have continued well into the future with a different sort of a style. Um, same disappointment with the Mark II lineup. There was so much potential for that format. And, you know, Lord and, and uh, Blackmore all saying, you know, just think what we could have produced if we'd stuck it out, the quality of material that would have come from that. So it's similar to that. Look, I like the way the album uh, begins. It's quite powerful. Uh, it finishes with a couple of songs that have a little bit of a different feel about them. But that's what I like about it because the album's diverse in its delivery. I really love that. And uh, it's a great album that had some potential of setting Purple into another really good direction, a second life, if you like. Um, but I'm fortunate that it didn't eventuate. But I love the album. I love listening to it. It's my number five. Good choice. And more about that later. <laughs> My number five was Deep Purple, Perfect Strangers. So you've got 1984, The Great Reunion, and Mercury or Poly, um, Polydor Records throw um, enormous amounts of money in that time for the band reunion. I think it was rumoured about $2 million each. A lot of excitement. Um, you know, the Purple Reunion had been spoken about for at least between 1978 to 1984. So through the, the various offshoot bands, there was always this um, rolling sort of uh, rumours that Purple were going to get back together because there were all these offshoot bands. You had your White Snakes, your Rainbows, your Gillens, um, but there was all this you know, sort of um, a tidal wave of rumours that, you know, when are Deep Purple going to get back? And it finally happened in 1984. I think this is a really, really great album. And like um, a lot of the Deep Purple albums, the opening track, I think Deep Purple have a knack of having killer opening tracks on their side one and side two. And Stan, on this one, knocking at your back door with the Jaws-like start, you know, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And then as soon as you hear um, Lordy playing those, you know, you know, opening chords and you've got the Roger Glover bass and then 
Richie Blackmore. When I put the headphones on, man, I had a shiver up my spine. I thought purple are back. You know, this is fantastic. I mean, it was in 1984, but it felt like a 70s album, but it had little tweaks that sort of made it feel like it was kind of more modern, but it still had that classic purple sound. And going back to the topic of killer opening tracks, Perfect Strangers, which you know, arguably is probably one of the 10 greatest Deep Purple songs of all time, that really uh, beautiful cashmere guitar bit. I listened to this um, in the last couple of weeks, and even the deeper cuts uh, are really fantastic. Uh, Nobody's Home. I, I used to like that in the day with the Pacey and the Cowbell and that really um, great little guitar riff. But one of the tracks that I've really gravitated to um, as I've got older and I didn't like as much in the day is Wasted Sunsets. It's a beautiful little ballad. Um, it's about a, you know, a hooker and just, you know, how things are sort of dire for this particular person but the way Gillen um, sings it it's beautiful Richie's guitar work is stellar um, and I think that you know maybe a couple of years later that's when he started to go on the downward slide as a guitarist um, because you know you can't keep up that sort of level of expertise and technique but I think he was still you know, he had some great guitar riffs in this um, particular album uh, around 1984. Um, you were on the, you went to the uh, the tour in Australia. You were at that concert where George Harrison um, played in the Sydney Entertainment Centre. It was a magical tour, magical concert. You know, that tour in the States was the second highest grossing tour just behind Bruce Springsteen. So they, they did major, major stadium business with this album. But unfortunately, and I think this is a topic for another show, they just didn't keep it up. But that's my number five, Perfect Strangers. And um, yeah, worth checking out. Yeah, good choice. Um, okay, my number four, Firebore, an earlier one uh, released in 71. Uh, made number one on the UK albums chart, and I believe three al purple albums did become number one on the UK albums chart. Their fifth album uh, and their second mark two. Um, so I might throw up that. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, killer choice. Okay, um, so Fireball, uh, title track again, you know, it's a great title track, uh, Fireball opens up with Fireball, not the best track on this album, uh, I've sort of gravitated towards uh, one or two others, um, the opening sound effect always intrigued me when I was first listening to it, then I listened to the Lord say, yes, it's an industrial air cleaner starting up, that's how that guy kicks off Fireball, so I can ah, so it is that. Um, so when people are asked to name standout individual purple songs, you don't always head to Fireball, I don't think, but this is an album where it's the collection of all the songs that makes the album what it is. It's a great listening experience. I like the way the order of the songs is, uh, is created because they just logically flow from one to another and that draws you into really getting involved in the whole album. So I love the, love the progression of songs through the album. It's, it's well designed. Uh, you know, I like Strange Kind of Woman, you know, it was, it was number three on the uh, US release of this album, but I'm glad that they've left Demon Eye there because, uh, Demon's Eye, because it's just a great song that really does grow on you as well. I just love the riff through that, everything about it, it's just, it's catchy if you like, but it's, it's, a, it's a great song, I love that, I'm glad it's there. Um, and again, you know, we, when you read the band members' own thoughts about the albums that they produced, and they, they're not really too fond of, uh, of uh, Fireball, you know, talking about it being thrown together too quickly, where something like Machine Head, they had about three weeks or more to really focus on it, and that's a quality album. But uh, this was thrown together quickly, but I don't get that feeling when I listen to it. I think it is quality. Um, you know, I can understand people saying, oh, that last song, No One Came, it sounds a little bit simplistic with, with the lyrics and the melody, but, you know, it's that continuous, relentless, driving beat that pumps through that song. When, when I finish listening to it, I just immediately play it again. It's just something that really gets inside you, and I just can't finish the album without going back and playing it again. Uh, I'm not really a big uh, fan of the Mule and Fools. Fools is okay, but uh, every one of the other songs, No, 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 Anyone's Daughter, you know, the lyrics in Anyone's Daughter, I think even Gillan didn't like it uh, when he thought back about it, but it's just a good, catchy song as well. 
Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a great album. I love it. It's my number four. Uh, and it's a really good example of what Mark II lineup could actually produce uh, when they put their heads together. I, I love the album. I play it often. Good choice. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, interesting Richie's um, guitar work on that album. There's a lot of um, harmonics and a lot of where he's just experimenting. So there's a, a couple of songs on that. Um, like I think No, 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 where he's he's not doing the guitar hero, but he's just playing around and just do, using sound effects. And there's a lot of space um, in his notes, harmonics. And I find that quite interesting. Um, actually, Ian Gillen um, rates that album very high, but um, not surprisingly, Richie Blackmore thinks it sucks. <laughs> Um, so you can see they're already <laughs> at loggerheads, but um, yeah, it's um, I think it's a it's a fine album, and that's a that's a really good choice. My number four is "Come Taste the Band." So 1975, you've got Tommy Bolan, you've got David Coverdale, you've got Glenn Hughes, um, Ian Pace, and John Lord. Um, I think it's a great album. It's different to Richie Blackmore and the Deep Purple Mark, you know, one, two, three. Um, it's Tommy Boland was a different type of guitarist. He was more of a fusion guitarist. Um, he, uh, you know, he was basically um, not in the traditional guitar hero of your Richie Blackmore's and, and your Jimmy Page, but he was much more experimental and very much in that um, that jazz fusion. Um, like I think his background, his pedigree, he played um, in the James Gang, and you know, check out some of his solo work like Teaser. Um, you can see that he's definitely a different style of guitarist, but when they auditioned all the guitarists for, you know, um, for this particular album, he was the standout and there was definitely some chemistry there. What I like about this is the songs and some of the songs um, are just, you know, top shelf deep purple. Um, one of my favorite is keep on moving. You keep on moving. I think it's one of the most emotional deep purple songs. And when you've got, David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes harmonizing and, and just singing that for their lives. It's just a great track. Coming Home's great. O to G. This was a band, I mean, that produced a fantastic album, but in the studio, there were drugs. It, there was a lot of despair. There was a lot of a uh, bit of a discord. Um, there was a lot of substance abuse between Tommy and Bolan and, and Glenn Hughes. Um, and, you know, it did affect their live performances and Deep Purple um, live were very hit and miss and that, that faded to a, um, a pretty uh, ordinary conclusion. But on album, I think this is a, a killer album. And in some ways, when you look at the lyrical content and David covered our stylings, it's a prototype for Whitesnake. So some of those early Whitesnake albums or even up to Come and Get It and uh, Ready and Willing, you can see where this um, originates from and come taste the band. It's sort of like a semi prototype for White Snake. That's my number four. I like it a lot. Um, I think it's a killer album. Fantastic. Okay. Um, all right. My number three, it's Burn. Um, and I was going to say to you before, I really love David Coverdale's voice uh, on that, um, on, on the last album. But in that sort of trend, it's, I've got some comments about that when I come into, the, into Burn here. So I'll just, Bring Burn up in the background for myself here to remind myself what I'm talking about um, and get rid of the candle from behind my head. Now, Burn, released in 74. It's a great album cover, isn't it? Uh, released in 74, it's the Mark III lineup. It was a number, number three in the UK albums chart. I thought it could have gone higher when you look at the other ones that made number one, their eighth studio album. Some fantastic tracks on this. Burn might just take your life. I mean, I can listen to them forever. Mistreated jumps out because Coverdale's voice is just brilliant. But I've got to say at this point, uh, and not everybody's going to uh, agree with me, but I'm a traditionalist, and it probably comes from the Mark II experience where one band member sings, one plays lead, one plays drums, etc. There's no, no shared arrangement there. A bit of backup vocals maybe, but it's not a shared arrangement. And this is something which irks me with this album. 
Now, I clearly, clearly remember when I was first listening to it, you know, you get the powerful tones of Coverdale, you know, they send shivers up your spine with a powerful masculine bluesy voice that he's got. And then very early in the songs, it's, it's Burn, particularly, I think, uh, from memory, we get Glenn Hughes jumping in very quickly. And I think it seems to be a clash. I mean, who owns the vocals to this song and the other songs? And it's a clash because they're starkly different from one another. You know, you've got Coverdo who's deep and powerful and you've got Gillen who's more high pitched. And that, that, that's a strain for me to listen to that. I'd rather just have one, one of them do the whole song on their own. Then I could, you know, I could uh, accept Glenn Hughes a lot more. But that destroys it for me. That hurts uh, Burnham and might just take him off a little bit in some other, other songs. But what saves it is just the brilliant musician, the musicianship in, in that album. You know, when when Lord puts fingers on the keyboard and Reggie picks up the guitar, there's, I don't want to listen to anybody else. And some of these songs, they just master so well. It's just something you want to listen to and hear over and over, over again. So I'll push the... Um, the Glenn Hughes experience aside, he's technically a great singer. I'm not taking that away from him. Sorry, Glenn, if you're listening. But fantastic singer, and, and I, do, I do admire that. But the two together, it doesn't do it for me. And I think, I, you know, I did uh, investigate that a little bit from the history, and I thought, what, what, how did that come about? And I understood that uh, Glenn Hughes was, I believe he's going to step into the band as the bassist plus singer. Uh, you know, a bassist singer, if you like, or he's going to be a co-lead singer. Uh, and at the time, I think they were talking with, uh, if I remember correctly, Paul Rogers from Free. They were trying to talk him into the band. And, uh, but he, had his, he said he saw some forming bad company, so that didn't eventuate and David Coverdale stepped in. So maybe that was a bit of a, an overflow from that, that discussion. And that's where David Coverdale stepped into that understanding that there was going to be a, a dual singers in the band. I don't like it, but uh, but they but they get through it, uh, and I think it's because of the great songs uh, that, that they, they do deliver. Um, yeah, so it might just take it off. Look, the standouts for me on that album, uh, which draws him back in all the time, is might just take your life. Uh, Purple just know how to construct a song. You know, it's just, it's not a basic structure, uh, and in it. Sometimes they surprise you when they come in with improvisations and uh, multiple improvisations through the same song. I'm partial to keyboards. I love John Lord on his Hammond C3. That is just a sensational sound, especially with all the distortion. Might just take your life. Covered out, kills that with his voice. Uh, so soulful, so powerful, so meaningful. Uh, very hard to find other singers, in my opinion, in the hard rock genre that, that are like that. And also very hard to find people that are so musically skilled uh, in, uh, that uh, make up the rest of the band. So brilliant album, that one. Uh, and uh, I've got to say the opening tracks here, yeah, Purple, as you said, Peter, Purple know how to choose the opening track. Uh, and Burn reminds me of the way, you know, Highway Stars, another good example of uh, opening an album with a great song. Uh, so those opening tracks, particularly the Burn, it's a great hook, just want you to make Force you to listen to the whole album from start to finish and pick it up again and do it all over again. So Burns my number three. Great album. Um, I couldn't disagree with you more on a couple of things, um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I think Glenn Hughes is fantastic on this album, and I think that the the two voices work very, very well. Um, Glenn Hughes has got a magnificent voice, and um, I understand there's been some criticism of him live that the dynamics, and you know, um, but on this album, I think there's a perfect synergy, and um, yeah, I. Uh, I mean, you rated at number three and they've got a very extensive discography. So I think even for those slight misgivings, um, I think it's pretty good that you've rated that so highly. And um, it is a it is a fantastic album. And I, I agree with you completely. But about the Glenn Hughes, I think he's just a magnificent singer. And I think it really goes well with with David Coverdale. Rightio, good choice. Um, Deep Purple in Rock is my next one. That's my number three. So Deep Purple in the 60s were a psychedelic band. Um, they were sort of picking up Vanilla Fudge. They did a lot of cover songs. Um, their big hit was Hush. They were trying to find their feet. They had a different singer, Rod Evans, um, a different bass player, Nick Simper. Um, and, you know, 
Gillen's in, Glover's in, and then they create In Rock. This is a game changer album. This is 1970. This is like the prototype probably for hard rock, heavy metal. Um, you've got the opening track, Speed King. You've got Child in Time, which is like their, their stairway to heaven. It's a, just a magnificent song um, and one of the great lead breaks of all time from Richie Blackmore um, into the fire it's a classic album and it is the prototype for modern hard rock or or heavy metal if you want to go back in time and look at 1970 you probably look at Black Sabbath self-titled and you'd look at Deep Purple in rock as to the foundations of hard rock and heavy metal it's influenced so many people even Bruce Dickinson said um, you know he he heard Ian Gillen on that album, screaming like a banshee, and he said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a rock singer. So Deep Purple in Rock, um, it, both on a musical and a historical and a, a, a game-shifting sort of level, that's the, uh, the album, and that's my number three. Yes, very good choice. I, can't, I was looking at that one as well, but, um, yeah, but that's a great lineup of songs on that album, I must agree. Okay, my number two is who do we think we are? I might throw that onto my backdrop here as well. If you bear with me, here we go. Yes, uh, I love this album. Um, you know, it's the mark, last of the Mark II albums, uh, released in 73, and he made it to number four in the UK charts. I think it's his seventh studio album. Uh, a lot of good songs in here as well, and it's sort of like uh, what I described with Fireball, how the songs just roll into one another so very, very well, and even finishing off with a very different Our Lady at the very end of side two. Uh, so they've worked it out very well. And again, open up with that brilliant woman from Tokyo. Uh, yeah, the last Gillen and, and Roger Glover connection until Perfect Strangers 11 years later. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's quite an important uh, part in history, I think, for Deep Purple. Uh, yeah, and at that time, you know, everybody's talking about the band being in turmoil at the, at the time of the recording, but it still delivers a really good listening experience. I love it. It's got that bluesy feel. Uh, one of the great tracks, I just, I just patiently wait for it to come up, uh, and it's placed in line, a very long song. You know, I've heard some criticism of it, but it's a song that really builds, keeps you hanging in there, reaches a number of crescendos through throughout the song. I like that long build up. You know, it, it's it's like a, it re it's reaching a climax or a number of climaxes, like those crescendos I talked about during the song. Yep. And it, it gives you a bigger impact when that happens. Uh, yes. You know? uh, so I love that. Uh, I love that. Uh, I, I love all the instrumentation in, in that in that uh, song as well. Very different. Very. Uh, it's a. It's not not a, a common type of song that you'd, you'd, you'd often hear that Deep Purple produce. It's very, very different. That's what I like about it. It stands out, stands on its own. Um, so yeah, this album, it's a standout in, in my Purple Library. I, I really love it. Uh, as I said, I love that opening song, Woman from Tokyo. Uh, every time Lordy puts his fingers on, those, on the piano keys, it's just something really, really special. And that's what I love about this song. It's just not run of the mill stuff. But I've got to say, when I first heard the song, it's something I had to get used to a little bit, and that's that mellow bit in the middle. You know, it's real rocky to start, fantastic riffs and everything else, great singing, and then it slows down, quietens down, gets very melodic. And I think, is this what I really want to hear in this song? Is it spoiling it? And then it, then it starts up again in a really, really great finish, uh, especially with the piano as well. And then after a few listens, then... I, I, you just become accepting of it. That is a woman from Tokyo and it works well. Uh, and it was all intentional, of course. That's the way they wanted it to sound. So it was just something I had to get used to, but I love it. So I, I don't, it, it doesn't hurt me at all these days. You, you don't mind the honky, you, but you just don't like the honky tonk piano bit. <laughs> Oh, the, the honky tonk's all right, but that that's that really quiet stuff in the middle, you know. It's, right. just, it's, it's like a different song. It's like yeah. it's a great song and it's been interrupted by some other song and then they're going to get back to Woman from Tokyo and dispense with it. That's yeah. sort of the feeling I had. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I love the piano right through that uh, song and, and, the, and the main riff that goes through that song. It's brilliant. Gillen's vocals, of course. Uh, you know, mm. he's, he's a great screamer, Gillen. Uh, when, when he puts all, all his yep. energy it, it's great to hear that. Um, so I really enjoyed listening to this album. Um, I think it's, it's sort of in the same vein as Fireballs. It's sort of a style. It's got similar similarities in their styles, I think, across both those albums. 
And it's uh, this is an album I always enjoy listening to. Um, Rat Bat Blue, obviously, that's a standout. Smooth Dancer, those things you probably wouldn't pay much attention to when you give them a good listen. They're standout songs as well. Qu quality songs and a quality album. It's my number two. Very good. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, well, a couple of little uh, sort of bits of trivia. Um, so it's the last Mark II album, and the next Mark II album was Perfect Strangers. So the album's called Who Do We Think We Are? And then the next album that came out in 84 was Perfect Strangers. It was sort of like question, response. So it's a little bit of trivia. I like that album too. And um, the, the track that I gravitate to, going in the theme of killer opening tracks on every Deep Purple album, is Rap Bat Blue. And I love that um, um, John Lord um, sequence of solo where it absolutely goes berserk and it's sped up. Um, I think I think it's some sort of Moog um, sequencer, maybe one of our... Um, you know viewers can just put it in the comments but it just absolutely goes berserk and just adds a lot of flavor and um you know a neoclassical flourish to that to that song but um yeah it's an extremely underrated album and i know the band didn't like it at all they were fatigued um they in those days stan um a lot of bands like uriah heap and sabbath and and um purple they were putting out two to three albums a year that's just you know, with a touring schedule, that's just um, unbelievable. They wouldn't, you couldn't get away with that now. And, um, you know, for Purple to do, um, put albums like of that quality um, is just, uh, just remarkable. But no, that's a, that's a great, that's a great album. Right, we're getting the business end. So number two. Machine Head, <laughs> flipped it around. Well, it's their most popular album. It's the million dollar seller, um, you know, multi-platinum in America. It contains the song that really every single budding guitarist has played, um, the three chords, uh, Smoke on the Water. Um, you've got Highway Star, again, the theme of opening, killer opening tracks on a Deep Purple album. Lazy. Um, space trucking never before maybe i'm a leo there's just no filler whatsoever every single track is stellar it's got some brilliant blackmore guitar work it's a very dry album in the sense that how it sounds it was uh, recorded in um that hotel at montro near lake Geve uh, G geneva um but it's just you know it's just a fantastic album. It's got all their classic hits. If you look at a Deep Purple song set, you'll see most of this album is on their song set to this day. Um, I don't really think I need to go much more into it because it is the quintessential Deep Purple album. And I guess that, um, you know, if aliens came down to earth and they sort of, you know, sort of said, I want one Deep Purple album that sums up their career, you go, <laughs> that would be it there's nothing much more i can say um it's yeah mark ii's finest and that's my number two no arguments from me but uh the only argument i have is that um it is not and i'll put, put it up for myself here it is not number one so, um, so I'm not going to talk too much more about it because you've already covered it really, really well, Peter. But uh, yeah, it's it's the iconic Deep Purple album. It's the first one I ever listened to and it just sticks in my mind for oops, for every year since all those years ago. Uh, it's their second number one in the UK albums chart. Uh, I think it went number one within about seven days, they're saying. Uh, and right, yeah, there's no filler there. I mean, I've gone through the, uh, the song list here and I've highlighted basically every song there as a standout. You know, it's been called one of the uh, essential hard rock albums of all time. Yes. I don't think many people are going to disagree with that. Uh, and yeah, when I, when I dropped the needle on the first track back in the day, uh, everything changed for me. I was just hooked on Deep Purple. I thought, what is this band all about? It's just absolutely fantastic. And it's that smoke in the water, like you said, it's that iconic riff. Everybody picks up a guitar, even if they can't play anything else, they can play the smoke on a water riff. 
Uh, but when when you look into the um, you know the Frank Zappa story, you know Funky Claude Claude Knobs was the producer there or something at the time. Everything starts to make sense, and it it brings that that song even more to life because there's history there. There's all those things happened. You know? It's a compelling. It's a compel. It's compelling storytelling. Um, like Gillen's lyrics, uh, it's a really compelling story that he's putting together in that song. Yeah, it's, it is just so brilliant. Uh, you're right. Uh, but it, the other songs, like Lazy. I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I was learning piano. So obviously, you sit behind a keyboard, well, you want to learn Lazy. Of course, you can never play it like John Lord. It's just impossible. He's just yep. absolutely brilliant. But it's, it's an absolutely incredible uh, track. The thing that uh, you can't help doing sometimes, though, when you listen to Lazy and Smoke and Water and Machine Head, and you've heard it on, you know, the Made in Japan album, there's some differences there with uh, with the way they play it live that you think, oh, it'd be nice if those little things that they've introduced, that'd be nice to see in Machine Head. But you quickly forget about it when you've got Machine Head, got your headphones on, and you're, and you're really uh, hooking into those two songs. You forget about that, and you really... Uh, accept the songs for what they are and uh, you, you give those songs real credit. They're just unbelievable, unforgettable songs. So Lazy and Smoke and Water, absolute standouts for me because of those iconic riffs. Uh, the other songs are great. Maybe I'm a Leo. You know, they reckon it's Gillen's birth sign it's, it's, and he wrote the song, I think. But that's a catchy sit back and listen to a sort of a tune as well with some great improvisation uh, from both Lord and Blackmore as usual. I mean, every time I listen to a, a purple song, you just can't wait. Well, I can't wait to hear what Blackmore and Lord are going to do when they've got the stage to themselves. And, and, and I'll finish off by saying Never Before as well. You know, that was the commercial track that they lifted off the album, performed fairly well as a single, not fantastically. I think it was that, that was their, that was the first single, I think. Um, I guess our viewers will correct me. And it flopped. A um, bit of a strange single to, to release it. But they released uh, Smoke on the Water and um, that got to number four in the American US uh, Top 40. So go yeah. figure. Yeah, I read that. It, it did really well in the US, but never before. I like that one too. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's a very commercial track, I know, but it's it's a great driving sort of a track as well. And I always listen to that great piano piece at the end, the way John Lord finishes that song with that great piano. Uh, and people on YouTube trying to copy it all the time as well. It, it, it gives testament to how good it is. But anyway, you've said enough about that, and probably I have as well. That's my favourite. I just can't get away from it. Machine Head's my number one. No, a great, great choice. And um, just um, still on Smoke on the Water, that that lead break of Blackmore's, um, I think Rolling Stone um, summed it up best, saying that it was the lead break that conquered America. So that particular year... Um, just American radio was just playing that song and it was the lead break that conquered America. It's really interesting because I've got a lot of the, uh, the demos, a lot of different versions of Machine Head and Blackmore cannot play the same lead back break in um, twice. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll change it up. So I've heard Smoke in the Water with different variations of the lead break. I think he's got a very short attention span. He just likes, his mind is churning and he just wants to go on to the next thing. And um, for them to get that one take and, you know, the lead break, the way it is, um, I think, you know, that's that's outstanding. But, yeah, great album. Rightio. So business end for me. There you go. That's my number one choice. Burn. I'm a unabashed um mark three supporter and i always have rated this is my favorite album of all time um i think this is just it's an exciting album um i think when you put the needle on track one with burn it's just you get a whooshka it really just hits you between the eyes and um you know even side two going with the theme of killer tracks you fool no one um I don't think Ian Pace ever played the drums as well as he did on this album. Some of the most complicated fills. And um, I read a story about You Fool No One that he it took him so many takes to get it um, right because it was such a complicated drum fill. But my God, when he gets it, he nails it. Um, but I think Ian Pace in this album, you've never he's never been better. Um, so they get Coverdale. Coverdale um, auditions. Um, he basically sends in a tape 
because it was in a melody maker that Deep Purple were um, wanting to audition um, various singers. So he did a drunken rendition of a song and um, they were listening to it. And even though he was out, you know, sort of, it wasn't the greatest audition tape, Lordy heard it and said, that, that guy's tone is really, really good. And they got him in and they auditioned him and um, the rest is, is history. Um, yeah, look, I think that um, Blackmore liked the, the masculine sort of um, Paul Rogers tone in, in Coverdale's voice. Um, and I think during this album, it contrasts beautifully with Glenn Hughes. He's got that Stevie Wonder, that, um, that very soulful voice. And to me, I think this is like um, a soul group, like Sam and Dave, where you have these soul singers and they're interchanging. And this is, this is like a, a hard rock version of Sam and Dave, where they're doing that interchanging. You always know that Coverdale's the lead singer, but when... Um, Glenn Hughes chimes in. I think it's wonderful. Even the deeper cuts might just take your life is a great one. Lay down, stay down. There's a middle section where Lordy's just trading off playing the piano and, and Blackmore comes in with his guitar. Oh, I've got to shear up my spine right now just thinking about it. Sail away and mistreated. Is that the greatest cut, one of the greatest Coverdale vocals on vinyl ever? Um, it's probably a, it's probably um, a power ballad. It's probably the the most it, the origins of the '80s power ballad, but the way it builds up, and you know, telling a st story and it's bluesy, it's magnificent. So why do I like this above Machine Head? Well, I think it's it's more edgy. It's a sexier album. I think the performances are punchy. It's more in your face. Machine Head. Don't get me wrong. It's clinical. It's dry, but it. it beautiful it's it's like you know 10 out of 10 but i'll give this album 11 out of 10 because i just think that coverdale and hughes just lift this out of the park and i think the band was just on fire and um you know needless to say so machine head went to number one who do you think we are went to number three um and this album you know with a new lead singer and new lineup, it continued the popularity. If anything, they were more popular in America, like the um, that the famous concert at uh, the uh, in the park where Blackmore smashes his his guitar. That was in front of three hundred thousand people. So um, they were a, a big draw card off the back of this album. I think this album is aged well, and I think if you look in a lot of uh, critics' polls, Burn is always high up in the list but anyway that's my pick number one maybe slightly controversial but um it is what it is and that's my number one excellent so any honorable mentions yeah just quickly and you've already covered it i mean perfect strangers is my honorable mention you know that uh their 11th album back in 84 reformed mark ii um you know it was only number five in the uk charts and again, it's I, I like it for I'm partial towards it for some strange reasons. I mean, there's those two absolute killer tracks, as you say, knocking at your back door and perfect strong. I love knocking at your back door. And you're right, there's the keyboard, it just shed, sends shivers up your spine. It's a different reverberating sound. It just goes right through you, and you just want more and more of it. I mean, I like that album just solely because of those two tracks. You know, and there's a, I think there is a, a lot of filler in there. And I think the album did cop a lot of criticism because of that, because of, there wasn't quality right through the whole album. But it's uh, it was great to see um, Purple back and doing something really, really special. And as you said before, Peter, I'm partial to it because um, and, uh, I, might, I might throw it up on my background because I was there. It was December 13. Uh, and uh, that was when uh, good old George Harrison came up on stage. I was too far away to actually recognise who it was. I'm, Who's this? Why are they playing Lucille? And uh, and I didn't really didn't know who it was, but obviously something was going on. Really Arnold happened. from Liverpool, he said. We've got Arnold from Liverpool on stage. Yeah. So I, if you, yeah, if you're in the back, you probably. I mean just from memory did they have video screens if you're in the back rafters at the Sydney entertainment center i um, did see it back in the day i didn't know so if you're in the front you probably would have tweaked and gone it's a beetle yeah. uh, oh, you could see him couldn't you I mean, yeah that's an actual picture from a bootleg i think yeah. uh, my background so people in the front rows would have seen it 
But uh, yeah, so that, that was, I mean, that's why it's, it's coloured my opinion because I was there and, and what happened on that night is really etched in history for me. But I love the album. It's got those two really great tracks. I could listen to that over and over. Not the whole album, but a few of those songs and probably a couple of others, they do it for me. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good honourable choice. Um, I, if I was going to do, I'd probably go Fireball. I think um, I said it before. I think it's um, very underrated. Um, there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, I think Blackmore's deconstructing a lot of the songs and um, trying different sounds and harmonics and letting the songs breathe. Um, and it's got some, you know, killer um sort of uh, deep purple hard rock songs that we're used to like fireball and demon's eye that is a great song so that's probably in my bubbling under list um and also i'll do an honorable mention to the house of the blue light which was the follow-up to perfect strangers didn't do um so well um commercially and that was probably the decline of the reunited mark ii because you had blackmore and gillen fighting again <clears throat> and um, resulting in Gillen leaving the band. They brought in Joe Lynn Turner, and then you went through, look, I'm not going to go through it. Everyone's read it um, to death. But I think um, I recently just played it, and it holds up well. It's interesting. It, it's got some really um, good songs, um, Bad Attitude um, is a, as an example, is a really good song on that album. But, um, you know, it yeah I, I i think it was under the shadow of perfect strangers it didn't do well commercially but i think it's worth a, a listen um the house of the blue light well thank you very much for that stan that's been great so we've gone through our top five um i would really appreciate uh the viewers to uh put your comments as to what your top five deep purple um albums are maybe some things that a bit controversial that you want to just uh um, tell us what you think. Um, be nice. <laughs> um, please subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation and um, we're going to have plenty of chats coming up in the uh, foreseeable future. Bye now. <laughs>